Yeah. Because life's just going to go by regardless of whether you 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 overthink or whether you don't think, whether you worry or don't worry. I suppose that's the third phase, which is procrastination. Yeah, exactly. Oh, procrastination is. But we all do it. He's asking me what made me happy, so I started to say, and he's like, "Remember, your diary is a reflection of your self love." And I was like. Wow. So welcome back to the Connect You podcast. We have Dee Ludlow, serial, serial entrepreneur, um, founder of the 5AM Club, the 5D program, um, investor in stocks, investments, crypto investor. Um, but I don't want to take too much away from him. Dee, introduce yourself, please, mate. Yeah, my name's Dee. It's good to be here. Um, as you said, uh, founder of the 5AM Club mainly, and then a lot of stuff branches off there. Yeah. Um, mainly focused now um, on my main um, business which is 5D Capital Partners which we buy SMEs in the UK and the US. So this interview can go we can go on for hours um, for use that don't know D um, mm. he invested obviously in property as, he's, mm. as he's mentioned um, and he has been for, for quite some time mm. um, SMEs and crypto stocks the, the list is endless mm. we can talk about that we can do what we normally do and we can start at the very beginning which is where i like to start mm. so take us back Dee, to when you was at school right at the early years because uh, it always fascinates me to know what has motivated you and driven you to get to where you are today so in school um i wasn't very motivated as in like, education mm. um i wasn't the best student to be fair um i, I like sport in school is the only thing I really enjoyed. I know it sounds bad because it's not that, you know, teachers are teachers, right? But I felt that my PE teacher, he was like in shape. He used to play for like Wales basketball. I think he played for Wales like rugby when he was younger. So it was like a role model in what he was teaching. So for me, it was, I know I liked sport and I enjoyed sport. Whereas some of my other lessons, like business was a big one for me. Um, you know, my dad was in business, so I wanted to learn business, but and nothing to take away from my business teacher, but she'd never run a business, so I found it very hard to relate. And it was kind of the same situation in most subjects. And overall, I just don't think I enjoyed school too much. So, yeah. Uh, I don't really know how deep I need to go into the school. It, stuff, mate, really. mate, as long yeah. as as much as you want, but I've seen mm -hmm. on some of your interviews that you've you've actually said that you question the teacher and that they sort of yeah. come back at you yeah yeah so with business i was there's running through um a cash flow forecast and uh, actually it was incomes and expenses it was looking at incomes and expenses and and just the overall cash flow of business and um mm. we was running through a diagram and i basically said like what well, you know can you give us a real world example of where this is used because obviously i was in school mm. And um, I actually like my business lesson was very different. None of my friends were in it, so I didn't like mess about it as much. I, I actually tried to learn, and um, yeah, she, she couldn't give me an example because she's never run a business. And like this may sound ignorant, but for me, I feel like if I'm going to learn something, I need to learn from someone that's done it, like you're teaching stuff that you haven't done. And I don't know, I just lost a bit of hope in it. And I also don't believe that you should limit you limit yourself if you don't do particularly well in school it's not like i did bad in school i was just average but and i didn't really put enough time into it so probably because i didn't value it and i was just more concerned about other stuff at the time but yeah i don't think you should allow that to limit yourself because we're told that that's what you need yeah. and and something that i i actually <laughs> someone asked me this question before and and it's sort of caught because um i don't think people should allow no accreditations shouldn't allow limitations because you know there's so many aspects of life where you could be in certain rooms where people may say to you like you know well where, where do you go to school especially in the states it's massive over there like you know the amount of times i've been in rooms where people have said to me like oh, what school did you go to or you know for them it's like cambridge and oxford in the uk i'm like no <laughs> yeah like high school level and i just went into business and what i find is that a lot of the people that did go through school which i think that there's 
there's some huge benefits to going to certain schools, yeah. like the network and the people that you meet there, and you can learn a lot of things, right? I think, you know, so I'm not going to take anything away from that side of the education system, but also you go out into the real world and learn business, you learn about life a lot quicker, mm. and you learn that, look, things ain't always going to go good for you, you're going to fail, and it don't feel very good when you do fail. And I think the earlier do you learn how to fail and you understand failure, and I think the better, in my opinion, because especially now in the world we live in now, I got kids in their school now. Um, we had a meeting a few weeks ago, and they said that um, they they can't fail tests until I think eleven years old or twelve years old. So they don't tell them they failed, but they'll just work on the stuff that they they didn't get right. And for me, I'm like, no. If they failed, they failed. They need to understand that you're gonna get stuff wrong. Yeah. It's okay to fail. Why, why, why we shouldn't be protecting and cushioning everything. I think the world's just gone soft. Was that um, the soft mentality? Was that um, forbidden in a way by your parents? Uh, and was that, I say, uh, a reflection upon the way you was brought up? Because it certainly was with me. Yeah. So, my, probably not my mum. I think I think that you could say mum may have been too soft. Mm. But my dad, there was, you know, when you have to go on like this study leave, when you get to, yeah, the, yeah. Like, yeah. I was like, yes, yeah. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> going out every day. My dad was like, nah, you, you got to do the school hours, yeah. studying. And I'm like, well, what? nah, all my friends are going out. Nah, you, you got to, so, and I used to like <laughs> pull up something else on the computer or I'd be yeah. like doing something else. But um, yeah, like he, he was very different. Like if I was, if I woke up and I was like, I don't feel like going to school today. I, I've got a headache. My mum would be like, oh, it's okay. And he'd be like, no, you're going to school. I'd be like, I could have like tonsillitis. You're going to school. Like, it was, And I think that it just shows you a form of, you start to learn a form of discipline that you don't, you didn't, you don't understand that it's, it's impacting you there and then. And I think it didn't done me good, you know. Oh, well, it clearly has. <laughs> and I think you've, you've touched on a few things there, failure, network. Mm. I mean, how important do you think the network is, um, obviously, around yourself now for people to get have a network around them? Massive. Um, I know some people like to underrate networking, and I think that it depends on networking. But, yeah, you can say that some of like the property meets, for instance, oh, why do you go to these property meets? And, you know, but I think there's different levels, right? And yeah when you first start going to them, you meet good people and you're, you're still learning, so you're absorbing a lot of information. And then when you feel that you've absorbed enough information in that room, you want to go and network in another room. And But it's never ending. If, if, if you speak to almost every successful person, they've got a great network of people. Um, and we, we can't do all this on our own. People, no. when you first like start entrepreneurship or whatever, people, you get really egotistical, as in like you're in this like, Gr massive growth phase of like learning new things and you start to get a bit ignorant in, in your per not everyone but you can get really ignorant in your personality ego gets big and you, you start to tell people you want to tell everyone all the stuff that you're learning and you know mm -hmm. and you feel that oh, i know something that people don't and, and you you do but i think that you know when you start to understand like there's more to this and and and, and there's more to learn i don't know i think it just network opens up everything and i think you you start to realize that you have to remain a student of life because and don't let your ego get on top of you because you know you can't do this alone you know you need advisors the biggest people in the world have advisors right mm. you know elon musk will walk into a room and he's got a team of advisors on the table saying like we need to do this on this this element of the business this on this he's an ideas person right mm. now he's obviously a driver mentality but he's an ideas person and i think that the quicker we learn that we can't do this alone and you do need people around you and it's okay to ask for help i think you'll start to see gr massive growth because i was one of those people that felt that like i didn't need no help like at all i just uh, i don't need no help when i was younger i can do this on my own that's interesting i was just about to ask that did you struggle to ask for help yeah when i was when i was younger yeah. i yeah i i just didn't want i wanted this i had this stupid egotistical th thought of i want to be self-made yeah and you can still be self-made with help mm. but i was like no i'm self-made i'm doing all this on my own so like i would do i don't know, start a business earn some money reinvest it into something else reinvest it into something else and i just build my own cash pot and i wouldn't want no investment no advice 
and I just learned the hard way. And of course, you you build, you naturally build business acumen by learning the hard way because you, you're doing everything wrong. So you learn how not to do everything. And I hundred percent agree with that. I mean, I've done that. I'm hundred percent guilty of that. I've uh, acquired a business by doing exactly that, mm. and it absolutely failed. Um, categorically failed and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll come on to failure in a minute um, not just in business but in family life I've done the same um, I, we will come on to that in a minute but is there a right way of networking because people say um, speed networking or, or go around and collect as many cards as, it, as you can I mean to me building a my, my own opinion you've got to build a relationship up it's not a case of just walking in a room getting to know everyone You've got to build a relationship over time. It's not a quick, quick fix. No. Yeah. Also, people go and network and think that that they approach the whole. Let's say you go to a room of, and you're about to network. People approach the room as in, well, I need to work out who in here I can get something out of. Like, yeah. Oh, this person, they, they have no use for me because they're mm. I'm past them in my journey. That's is what people mm. approach rooms of networking. And look, I don't know if there's a right or wrong way, but in my opinion. That the best I've ever got out of networking and the most that I think that has come around full circle and helped me are people that I've helped at the start. Mm. And it could be the smallest thing. It could be a referral. It could be something small. And then, so the people that you feel may not have, may not have value, don't disregard them because you, you, you never know. Everyone's trying to do the same thing. You know, when you're in those rooms, people are trying to better themselves and grow and someone may have a bit of luck before you. So try and help people. Like it will come back around full circle. Even if it's not that person, it may be somebody else. But going in a room and trying to just take, take, take. Like where does that get anyone in life long term? Well, it, it, it will get you a result, um, but that will be short lived. Hmm. You'll go up and up and up um, to a certain point. It, you'll peak, uh, like you mentioned earlier, and it will just fall off a cliff hmm. because there's only so much you can take. Yeah, until the show's over. Until it's over, mm -hmm. um, which has certainly happened for myself. I've mm -hmm. been guilty of that. And you just think, shit, now what's going to happen? It's mm -hmm. game over. Um, obviously, we're going to come on to, to the 5 a.m. club mm -hmm. um, because that's it's an amazing, amazing business that you, you mm -hmm. obviously you've built. But um, you mentioned like failure or mm -hmm. failing. Um, what, what was your first sort of thing that you, you failed on at school or, or your early years that you thought, do you know what, this is, I'm, I'm not going to do that again. So I learned a lot from music. I was like m massive into music and um, yeah, to just not, you fail every week because, mm. you know, you put some content out, people don't like it, people talk about it, people, you know, you, you're just open to mass opinion of people and you know how many musicians out there or people djs or um athletes that everyone likes of course you may have your outliers like ronaldo or messi but mm. you know not everyone likes everyone and i think that you learn to have tough skin quite quick and i think that taught me a lot it's very cutthroat um, i traveled a lot with it so i met a lot of people from different parts of the world and i just yeah i learned about failure massively i would say music first and sport too, you know, I'm a very competitive person. And and I think, yeah, I think that's why I think lo winners and losers need to be, it needs to be winners and losers in life, I, I, in my opinion, because you learn so much and that's how you grow. Because if you're, if, if, if you're doing something that you're trying to better yourself and then you do have some element of competitive nature, even if you don't, you're not a natural competitor, if you need to, if you're under pressure to do better in life because you want to provide for your family or you want a better life, if you're if you're in our sort of game, you have some element of competitive nature. Mm. So when you if you fail, the, the amount of learning that comes with failure, it doesn't feel very good. Mm. So the next time you do it, you know you don't want to feel like that again. And I think that for me, it used to eat me up if if I failed or lost at something. I, some of my friends just joke with me. I, I take everything serious. You play me on FIFA, you play me on anything, I need to win. And like, that's just, and I, I, I yeah, I'm, I'm a bad loser. I don't like losing, you know? And, um, but yeah, I think that that's helped me. Like for me and my personality, like the way I operate, like I, I, th I feel like I need that, you know? But everyone's different, right? And, but that's what I need. And 
I can completely relate to that. Mm. And I think for people that don't know, uh, you've got you've implemented your own framework, uh, mm. the seven step framework. Mm. Yeah. That, in fact, I'll let you explain what that is, and um, because I'll ask about that ABC column. Yeah. So the seven step framework was was mainly it was a few things that I put together over a long period of time, and it was mainly how most of us we either focus on one thing or the other, right? And and I I think that there's this you know specialize before you generalize, but there's different steps I think, and and first thing that most people overlook. They either spend too much time on it or they overlook it as mindset. Mm. And this took me a while to like understand other people on this because I was quite like a naturally driven person. Like I, I feel like my mindset as in I need to win, it's just been like it from young. So where some people you need to build on the mindset, the mindset's like like 95% of the entire thing. Mm. Cause you need to believe that it's gonna happen. Otherwise you're already up against, you walk, you're uphill battle straight away. Yep. So. The framework was like optimize performance and cash flow, but performance first. So first and foremost is the one thing on the framework is the filter. And it's how you you need to, it's like a high level filter that you need to be in control of what goes into your filter. We all have a filter, right? And our filter is what do we expose ourselves to every single day? Now for me, I used to allow anyone to take time from me in the day, right? And there's only so much time in the day and there's only so much you can get done. So like I would I would not go to a certain gym. I would not I put my phone on do not disturb because I know that I can't be and you can obviously on like an iPhone, probably on Android too, you can set your phone where only certain people can call you. So I would set it to one person, but the person that if anyone else needs to talk to me, if it's important, they can contact that person, they can speak to me, because I know I need to get stuff done. So in the filter, first and foremost, social media needs to go in there. You need to be able to optimize your social media, not spend all day scrolling on there, um, you know, be in control of it, because we're in control of what we see, right? Everything that we do. Um, two, your friends need to go in there, um, your family need to go in there, everyone does, because people will take time from you, and if you don't filter the stuff out, and your core focus at the bottom of the filter is one thing and everything going in the top of the filter, that's like everything not going in the top of the filter and just it's just coming down and taking time from you, then you're just working against yourself. Mm. So everything that you feel may be a distraction needs to go in there. And this sounds so cutthroat when you say put your fam family and friends in there, but you know, I'm not saying don't speak to family and friends. I'm saying that if you have a core focus and you want to get something done, people underestimate what it takes to... to, to to be truly successful in something. Nothing's easy. And no matter how many get rich quick like schemes and strategies that people dress up and tell you all these things, nothing is gonna come easy. Like it just does that's not how life works, unfortunately. You know, and and even when you think you, you're getting somewhere, something happens and then you go and adapt and adjust. So I think the filters number one. The ABC column is just a way of like prioritizing your tasks. So you have your ABC column. In column A is like your high focus tasks. Shouldn't really be more, well, for myself, three to say six max per day, but ideally three. They're the stuff that only you can do, mainly like strategy or stuff that just requires yourself. B is stuff that is less important than A, but potentially could be outsourced. And then C needs to just be all your outsourced stuff. Now, when I first started this, a was just huge because I thought that oh, no one can do any of this, only I can do it. And then after a while, you start to realize that that's just so unproductive. I was just putting stuff in A because I thought only I could do it. And unfortunately, again, that's where your ego comes in. You realize that almost there's so many things that people are better than you at. And, you know, the quicker you learn that you are not the best at everything, <laughs> the mm, better. Yeah. And then so your C column should be huge and your A column should be tiny. And then there should be a few things that may fall into B so it's just mainly getting all that focus and organized first and then if you can operate where you you are organized and, you're, and, and your time management's good then you can focus on the things that actually give you income and you know like of course I'm a big believer in taking action so I, I like a lot of people a lot of people forget to take action while planning you have to take action. So people get very good at planning. So I don't want to overdo that. Oh, you need to be super organized because you actually need to just do stuff. Um, and if you're not an actually organized person and you're a bit of an organized chaos individual, but you, you get someone to be organized for you if you don't want to do all that and just crack on and get take action because people do. They, they, they forget to do it. They're like, you know, 
an example I used um, before was a good friend of mine showed me uh, a business plan and it was such a detailed business plan. Right? It was, I think it was like 25, 26 pages. It was huge. He had all the facts, all the statistics of for his, what he wanted to create, the footfall, how much percentage of the footfall he needed, what's the likelihood. It was so many, it was so much detail, right? And I was like, wow, this is like super detailed, really analytical. And I was like, so when when you're getting started, he's like, I, I, <laughs> I just had to say, you're already going bang. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, when you're getting started, this is a pretty good idea. And he's like, oh, I, I, I just need to, there's a few more things that you add to this. And I was like, no, that's you, you need to just do it. Like there's only so much planning you can do. You need to pull the trigger and take action. And it's easy to say to somebody, oh, I'm working on this, I'm working on this. And next week, the week after, oh, I'll do it next year. You just got to do it. And if you fail and you run into a brick wall, you'll learn how to get around it or climb over it. Mm. It's just, it is what it is. People are going to make mistakes. I suppose that's the third phase, which is procrastination. Yeah, exactly. Oh, procrastination is, but we all do it. Everyone yeah. does it. Yeah. You know, like even when you think that you've got it dialed, you don't. Like we all do it, whether it's on your phone, whether it's like, oh, I'm just going to go for a quick walk. I need to clean my head. We all procrastinate. Well, again, I would, I'd be guilty of it now. Uh, I'll be sitting on my phone, looking at Instagram. Before you know it's 10 minutes, you think, shit, I could have been done something else. Mm. But yeah, again, once you've got then things in place, like you've mentioned, having your phone on do not disturb, Something, some people will think that that is excessive. Mm. However, I don't because I have implemented that quite a while back when I, like I said, I took over my first business. Um, but that I got a lot of kickback from all my friends that I fought with my friends and they said, you know what? We don't want anything to do with you. Mm. We're well, not friends then. Mm. Family didn't agree with what I was doing. I said, but I can't optimize my time, build my business in the way I wanted to build it. Did you receive any kickback from family and friends? Oh yeah. But <laughs> the, the one thing that I would say in my situation is I'd never done it before. Mm. So my ego got in the way because it was my transit. I wanted to make mm. it my own transit. Mm. And that's where the mistakes come in. So what, what kind of kickback did you receive? Just that mainly with friends, it was more like, they, it was more, it'd be more like sarky comments. Yeah. Like, like, we can never get hold of you anyway. Or like, if they see me doing something, it'd be like, oh, you know, superstar now, or oh, you've got time to post on social media. But like, to be fair, that's never bothered me. I feel that, like you said, if, if they're friends, they're friends and they'll stay there. But, you know, when you go through life, you go through different stages. Some people are lucky enough to find a friend or a group of friends in school where they stay friends forever. Other people go through multiple friendship circles. So mm. I'm not going to not do stuff. You know, end of the day, if you're my friend or a family member, this is my goal. This is what I want to achieve in life. You need, like for me, I want you to respect that this is what I'm doing. I'll respect you and what you want to do, respect what I want to do. And, you know, we can still be friends even if we talk once every six months. Mm. You know, sometimes, yeah, maybe I should spend more time and be like, I've downtime my friends. But this big thing of like work-life balance, like I enjoy work. Like I, For me, if someone said, oh, why don't you go down to the pub and watch football? Like when I'm down there, I'm still thinking about I want to work because I, I enjoy it. It's, it's not like I'm separating the hobbies to work. I actually enjoy, I choose work because I love doing it, you know? So... It's like, what am I balancing from? Am I forcing, trying to force a balance that maybe it doesn't need to be there, maybe it doesn't. But I feel that all we do in life is, is continuously put up walls and the false walls. I think that's all we do, you know, regardless mm. of what it is, is all oh, we need to find work-life balance. Oh, you know, you need to do this to retire here. You need to, it's always you need to do all these different things. You need to have purpose. What's your why? What's this? It's like, why can't you just, just live? Just do, just wake up. Do what you enjoy, live, and stop overthinking everything. Yeah, because life's just going to go by regardless of whether you 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 overthink or whether you don't think, whether you worry or don't worry. Your life's still going to go by. So I just try not to overthink everything and just let's just enjoy it. For we're here now. We're here on this podcast now. Right now, this is what I'm focused on because mm -hmm. we're here. I'm not going to overthink anything else. I, there's, it's not going to change anything. So my question to you then, I get asked this all the time. Mm. What do you do that makes you happy? So I, I, I enjoy work. So I spend time with my family. I, I enjoy travel. I, I enjoy eating out. I enjoy work. I, for me, 
I feel that I do everything already that makes me happy. I'm yeah. now pursuing that. I so for me, I think that the big thing everyone is trying to chase is just freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. So regardless of whether someone dresses up as a number or whether they dress it up as something else. Mm -hmm. Realistically, people want the freedom of choice, whether it's the choice to go and buy something materialistic, whether it's a choice to decide not to work, whether it's a choice to go and live in Thailand on three pound a day forever. Whatever, the, whatever it is, people are chasing a choice, right? So me, it's like, oh, I want to chase a choice. I want to wake up and decide, if I want to do this today, I'm going to do it. But realistically, I actually enjoy what I do now. So I already do a lot of the things that I want to do. Of course, there's always going to be different levels, but you know, happiness is, I think, now this is a completely like wild card topic, but I do believe a lot of happiness is a choice. I think success and happiness are very conflated. They're not the same thing. They're no, not. And also it's how you define it. Like who, exactly, exactly you, that. So success to some may mean something completely different to yourself, maybe mm -hmm. completely different yeah. to me, but happiness for you um, is, the choice to do whatever you want to do. It's exactly the same to me. Mm. So sitting in this room now, it's what I would choose to be doing. It's mm. what makes me happy. I have the choice to come and do this because I put myself in this situation. Mm. Whereas others would be like, well, no, I want to be sat at home with my kids after work. To me, yes, I'd love to be with my children. However, I don't want to be in a nine to five. Mm. That's to me the worst thing that you can possibly be mm. doing right now anyway, in the current situation we're in. Mm. Yes, the kids is absolutely lovely. However, I'm not going to be relying on, say, one source of income. No. That, that to me, is, is not a good situation to be in right now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation at the moment. And I think, like you said about happiness, you, only you know what makes you smile and makes you happy, right? And I think that yeah, we probably, a lot of us do take life maybe a bit too serious. People may mm. say, oh, I take life too serious, and maybe I do. I, I, you know, at the moment I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, I've had times where I've, I haven't enjoyed life. You know, I've had times when, when I was younger, I would say it was it was a lot of pain, but it was real, and I learned a lot from it. You know, and I made loads of bad choices. You know, when in my early or late teens, loads of bad choices, right? But you learn from it, and that, then I thought that made me happy. But looking back, I'm like, was you, was you really happy then? You know, and I think that as you, the older you get, you always look back at previous experiences in life and be like, what frame of mind was I in then? Like, you do stuff like, you know, I, I, I had a, like certain tattoos and stuff when I was young. I would never go and have those same <laughs> tattoos now. And I'm like, what was going through my mind then? To be like, oh, that, yeah, let's do. So like, we we grow as individuals, and then we our chemical balance changes, and okay. our, our, our our whole outlook on life changes, and yep. some of the stuff now I look back, and you know when like, you know, your mum, your dad, or a family member, or someone may say, oh, don't, you'll regret this when you're older, or don't do this, or do it that way, and you think you know better back then, and I I look back now, as a father myself, and some of the things I'm like, how how ignorant and dumb was you? Why why wasn't you a why wasn't you open to learn and why wasn't you teachable then? So I, I believe looking back from where I'm like now, um, I'm like absorb information, I'll try and learn off everyone in whichever way I can. Whereas when I was younger, I, I, looking back the person I was, I was completely unteachable and I had a too, my ego was too big. So for anyone that's listening, what was the pain that you went through and what, what advice would you give people now through the lessons you've learned from the pain you went through? Um, so there's a, I don't want to get this quote wrong, but I think it's the best maths you can do is projecting the, the consequences today to project your future decisions or the, the, basically the choice you make today to calculate what the choice you make today will lead to in the, the future you. And yep. that was something I couldn't get around. I would just do stuff impulsively, put myself around the wrong people in the wrong situations and it was stuff that it was like self-induced like pain as in like you're giving yourself like mental trauma and it's out of choice because you, you're deciding what room you're in you're deciding who you're around you know there's some times in life where people don't get a choice to what they do and where they grow up and stuff but 
you know, most of the time we're in control of our environment, who we decide to put ourselves around. And most of us, not most, I wouldn't say most of us, but a lot of people make bad decisions. And I was one of them when I was a kid, you know, and, and, and looking back, it's, I don't know, I, I look back and think you was unteachable, your ego was too big and you just didn't listen. And then when I think of what you can achieve in such a short space of time, which I do, I, like I said, things take a long time to like really get going. But what I mean is you could in six months, you can change, you can like make your mindset completely bulletproof in such a short space of time. Six months is nothing. Mm. But you just need you need to be able to give everything to it. You need to be dis disciplined. You need to be consistent, and you need to just completely get rid of all the fog, all the BS that's around you, and don't BS yourself because that's the worst thing. Is when we keep try to justify our decisions to ourselves. We do it every day. Like you know, you, if you if you decide that if you, let's say for instance you're in the gym, right, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm in the gym, so my goal, let's say your goal was to be in shape, right, then if we go and eat anything or do anything that compromises the goal, then we're BSing ourselves because you want one thing and you're doing the other. So we're, we're working against ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's the same as when you're working. So if you're trying to build something, like let's say you're building a company, right? And then you're taking additional days off when the company's not ready yet. You're working against yourself. So you're compromising the thing. So how much do you really want it? And, and when I started to learn more about myself and that, that bulletproof mindset I was, that that's when things change because i was like i'm doing stuff that's work i'm i'm competing against myself i'm doing things that's compromising the things that i want and i'm in control of doing it what am i doing and i, I do it all the time like you know if i if i am training i'm trying to get in shape and i'm on the road one day and i'm going somewhere like a few weeks ago we went to see we had a site visit on the way down i literally walked into the services and i went to my business partner mike i'm about to bullshit myself and he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to go and have a subway. And he's like, why are you bullshit? I said, because I'm told I'm meant to be eating clean. And I'm trying to, I, I've got a goal and I'm coming in here. And as I'm walking in here, I'm actually lying to myself yeah, yeah, yeah. going, it's all right. I went to the gym three times this week. Um, I've eaten good all week. My cheat day is not till this day. And I'm, 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 this is what's going through my head. I'm like, well, this is crazy because we all do this. But if you're not aware you're doing it, that's the problem. Yeah. You need to be aware. Like self-awareness for me is the biggest thing in life. Like if you, if you if you're not in touch with yourself and you're not and you you haven't got your self-awareness in place, it's damaging. What what can you do to the people? Um, and I'm going to get absolutely shot to bits if my family listens to this. What can you do to the people that know they're doing it but don't actually care, but say they care? So if you care about them, you want to help them then I think that all you can do is try and make them aware. But unfortunately in life, most people do not like to hear the truth. They don't like you being direct, even when they say they do. Mm. I know people that you say, they say, I'd rather you be direct with me. No, you don't. No, no. you wouldn't because yeah. I'm quite a direct person. And I know when I'm direct that you, you won't like it. Mm. However, on the flip side, no one really likes being someone being direct and confrontational to them, right? But I think the truth's always better, right? And so you can be direct with them. Some people don't take it on board because they don't, they don't want to believe it. And, and it's not just in like, say family and friends, it's in everything in life. Like we, people, most people don't like the truth. Even though everyone says they do, most people don't. They'd rather just not know. And it's hard because self-awareness is literally everything that comes back to it. Literally everything. If you're not doing something you should be doing and you know where you're doing it, then how are you going to grow? And I think you're right. Um, it, 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 the way that you the way that you tell that person or tell that individual, the way it comes across, the context that you say that, mm. um, it can be done in the right way. Um, there's some some ways that I previously said it, say that you, you're absolutely kidding yourself here. What what do you think you're doing? Um, can be said in a different way um, with a bit more empathy, for example, mm. as I would imagine it does or did with yourself. Say like with me and my other business partner. Um, it didn't so i was like very much to the point you're an absolute knob on your bike <laughs> but it was yeah it shouldn't have been that way i should have dealt with it a lot differently however it was my first venture so well, the, the, you learn there, there was a a college professor in america that did a, a study on self-awareness and they got a group of people and they asked them all of them do you believe you're self-aware and 95 percent of them come back and said yes 
when they actually conducted the research, the real number was 12 to 15%. So that means on a good day, 80% of us lie to ourselves. Mm. And it's, and, but the thing is, even when someone tells someone this, they'll still, they still don't think they're doing it. <laughs> and so for me, it's like, it's just biases in life. Like we, we, we look stuff that suits our narrative. This is what we literally do. Yeah. And yeah, like we, for instance, if you're, I don't know, like, if, if football team, you know, if you if you if you support a football team, you want to go and read all the good things about them, and you want to read why, if they're playing terrible, why now things are going to turn around, and and as a Man United fan, you know, this is what's been going on for ten years, right? So it's oh, this is going to be different, and then you, you want to believe the narrative because you, that's what you want to believe. So we don't look at the counter argument with crypto, right? Mm. As soon as I started to really dive into crypto. The first thing that I did, because I heard, I read, um, I, I read a load of Bitcoin books. The Bitcoin stand was the main one. Um, and there's another one, um, I can't remember now. It was like, I don't know, the power of Bitcoin or something. But I, I listened to a lot of people talk about it. And I was like, this sounds good. And, 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 and it was something that I was interested in. Mm. The first thing I did is go to YouTube and I typed in Bitcoin, Bitcoin's going to zero. And I went and listened to about, probably about 35, 40 minutes of someone absolutely destroying everything about Bitcoin. Because I thought, I'm going to get caught up in confirmation bias because I'm listening and reading everything that is directed to Bitcoin being this, oh, this power and all this stuff, all the good stuff about Bitcoin. So I just looked at the counter argument and then it made me realize what's my real opinion on it. I did the same with the property market. I did the same with business. I did the same with everything because... If you know what you like, you know what you want to hear, and the algorithm tell, shows us everything that we want. If you if you go on TikTok, Instagram, Google, and type something in, it's going to show you what you want to see, mm. and then they're going to show you another video to confirm your narrative, and it's going to show you another video. And so, if you don't look for the counter argument and you don't challenge your opinion, then you're like in a death spiral because you're just going to get caught up in a real maxi mindset on something. And I see it literally across all asset classes. When I see investors online, everyone gets caught up in this trap of this is the greatest thing. And it's, it's, it's honestly, it, it, it's mind blowing how people look and follow their biases. Well, this is why I, I love the 5 a.m. club because you've got 13 of what I would say is everything you need. Mm. You've got the, the tax planning, the asset protection, you've got crypto, property, M and any, anything, everything you can imagine is in there, but it's not one sided. Mm. Um, so let's touch on the 5 a.m. and then we'll dive into the crypto. Mm. Um, so, yeah, the 5 a.m. that was founded. Just tell everyone what it is, because if they don't know, which I would imagine they do, mm. what is the 5 a.m. club? So it's, it's like a big network of people. Network for entrepreneurship, really. Um, it doesn't matter if you're an aspiring entrepreneur or whether you mm. you've been an entrepreneur for years. It's it's a platform where, like you said, it covers all the asset classes pretty much. Mm. It covers um, mindset. It covers like general business stuff like marketing. It covers like social media management. Mm. Pretty much everything. This we've had speakers from various different sectors. There's over four hundred hours of content on there of just different people, real people that are doing more. Mm. They're, they're talking about right and, and actually are that, that's the thing yeah they and really you, are you can just go online and look at them right some of them are at different levels to others but they're all doing what they what they talk about right um but it was a bit it, it was an accident that, that it, it didn't you know it was 2020 lockdown happened i was getting a bit lazy and, and bored because mm. you couldn't go anywhere that's why i contacted a few friends said let's jump on um and just talk about business maybe we can help each other let's Get a mindset. Yeah, 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 Gavin, yeah. <laughs> and his mindset uh, to start, so my mindset to start with him, which said, we'll do it at 5 a.m. And originally it was Monday, Wednesday, <laughs> Friday. And then it went to uh, Tuesday and Thursday. And then it went to bi weekly then because it just developed and it was, it got a lot bigger. But social media, as, as you know, you share something, someone else sees it, and it become very hard to free flow in conversation because there's too many people on there. Yeah. So we was like, look, we need to get people to like maybe do a presentation and help each other that way, take a Q&A at the end. And and yeah, for me, it's just a place where I feel that I know that people have made very good friends. People have had, got business partners through there, investors through there. It's quite a solid network and very diverse network. And I don't know, it's, it's something that is like on my heart now, you know, even though 
like there's a lot of other stuff going on for me you know we've done charity work we've done a lot with it and in such a short space of time i think i made some really good friends mm -hmm. and and people through there and then from that you've obviously got the 5d yeah and then the, was it the five the capital as well yeah so that that's something like a bit separate from it but the sort of 5d program a, a few people was asking me if i offered like personal coaching yeah and i was just like nah uh, you know i was like no it's not really i don't want to do it um i always visioned in my head like oh, maybe i'll do it when i'm older and uh and i was like nah and then a few people asked me so um i said yes to one person and i was like look let's map out a plan because i see so many coaching programs that they're not really like built to get or focused on getting the result is a lot of like which the process is really important but i thought if i'm going to do this because I've paid for high ticket coaching myself and I didn't really like the aftercare or the communication. So I thought, if I'm going to do this, mine needs to be, have everything that I felt was missing. I want everything, right? Mm. So I worked with one person, we was getting results and then I took on another person and then my friend was like, oh, I said, so another person asked me and a few did and I was like, I can't keep doing this. There's too many. It's going to be, it's going to take away my own time for the stuff I want to work on yeah. so my friend said why don't you just make a mastermind in a group and do it in there so then, then develop from there and again like that so the 5am club is one thing like this when I think of how good the community is in the 5am club the 5d in regards to like help and like a power network is is completely different it's like honestly, in like our private groups, if someone asks a question before I even look, sometimes there's like ten to twenty comments. The amount of help and 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 value that people give each other, even up out with me pushed out, yeah, is insane. Like I, it's crazy that that's happened the way it has, and we've started to build something inside it because it's mainly focused on buying businesses where people can take part in um something a lot bigger from inside the network so there's a lot of stuff we're working on at the moment but 5d capital partners was something that was actually called in, in interlinks before and it was myself and i was buying businesses and then someone that i was coaching had a really good system um lead generation system a scene was very active very enthusiastic ambitious just reminding me a lot of myself and hard worker and he asked you to partner on a few deals with him and then i was just like you know what let's just let's just do it together from from where i was at then i was like let's just do it together and then um my cousin who's the other partner in the company i went out to see him in i think he was like mid 21 and he was seeing what i was doing like he's like this is crazy you know this is awesome what you're doing and he had already had an exit in his business a pretty large one to private equity and then he stayed in, rolled again, they sold again, and he stayed in. And now they're with one of the biggest private equity firms in the world. So he then got involved. So then it started to build. And, um, and my whole sort of outlook on what deals that we was looking for changed. Our criteria changed. Because I was like, we actually got a team now. And it, started, and it kept building. And we've added some other people since. So that's like a completely different thing. That's like what I would say is my real like day-to-day -day yeah. is that. And then... Like the 5am club and 5d are stuff that i'm passionate about and like i like seeing what people are doing and i also like the fact that we have the opportunity to partner with people on deals too which mm -hmm. which is great for everyone and, and obviously let's let's talk about the different asset classes um mm -hmm. and that's really what people want to know about is what's the best one and uh, what they should stick their money into um obviously that people in troublesome times as we all are um but I know one that you're heavy on is, is M&A, which we are going to come on to, but mm. crypto. Mm. And for people that don't know, what is the blockchain? What is Bitcoin? And, and obviously, I, I've got a very good understanding because mm. you've, you've taught mm. me. Um, so in a, in a short response to that, uh, sum it up if you could. So I think the easiest way, I think, is get, getting technical with what is blockchain, what is Bitcoin, when I see a lot of people explain this, I think that the reason why it goes over a lot of people's heads is because mm. they try and go down to the, right, the blockchain is this open source network, that, mm. da, 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 this open source ledger. But it's like, right, think about 
technology as it is now, right? And think about if you go in the shop and you go and buy something and you use Apple Pay, do you think of how that technology is being used? Do you ever sit there and wonder why? How did damn money go from there to there with a ping? No. Do you know why? Because no one cares because this is what we just use day to day. When you turn the TV on, no one thinks of how that happened. What signal went to the TV, when a camera was turned on, the mic. No, no one thinks of how technology is used because it doesn't matter. So I think that when people first try to go down the, the crypto and blockchain rabbit hole, they try and let's understand how all this works. Now, blockchain is just... Is it already being used? Some of the biggest companies in the world, actually, most of the biggest companies in the world already use blockchain, right? All the banks, IBM, all, all the major companies are using blockchain, right? And they're building and building and building on it. So it's like this is just going to be normal things. So when we look at like payments and international settlements and these remittances, all this stuff is just going to happen with blockchain. And you're not going to know, oh, this is blockchain. No one's going to think, oh, that's cool because that was blockchain. It's just going to be normal. So I think that. I wouldn't go down like the blockchain and crypto rabbit holes in. I need to understand all these things. Of course you can, but you're going to run into a wall where you're going to be like, oh shit, I don't even trust the system that we're in now because that's what it's going to do to you. So you start to understand, to understand crypto and blockchain, you need to understand our financial system the way it's already set up and built now. And that's when you're going to start, your mind will go because you won't trust anything. Mm. So I think that it's important to um, understand why it's why it's going to be a part of our day to day and why they're going to attach everything to it is because technology is deflationary. So ev eventually, which, what that means is some of the stuff that may have required manual labor gets taken away. And what happens is the price of stuff gets re the, the, the price of making something will become cheaper and cheaper over time because technology is deflationary. And all that's going to happen is with blockchain, it's just another part of technology. It's going to take away probably more jobs. It's going to make things quicker and it's going to make things more efficient. So that's what technology does. When you sign a mortgage, um, if you get a mortgage, it's going to be an NFT mortgage. It's going to be done via smart contracts, like title deeds or properties. It's so old school. All of this stuff's going to be eradicated and it's going to be, well, not eradicated, it's going to be blockchain is going to replace most of this stuff, almost everything we do. The thing is, because over the past, towards the end of the last bull cycle, because you had all the board apes, you had every random shitcoin project that was like, this Doge. is, the, yeah, you know, all this <laughs> fancy marketing that everyone got sold into, including me on some of them, right? Some great marketing. And because of all this, people now, it's like crypto is like a meme because of mm -hmm. it. So your average person is like, why would I get involved in that as a scam? Which most, I would say 99% of it is right now. Mm. You know, But understanding Bitcoin is different and what Bitcoin is and what it stands for. And when you understand the financial system, it's, very, it's a lot easier to understand Bitcoin because of the fixed supply. You know, And, and I think that's the difference. Of course, there's more, and this is a pre-programmed schedule. So every 210,000 blocks is a halving, and that's fixed till 2140. That's not changing until the last block's mined. So what it's, it's going to be very hard for me to go like into what I feel when that fits into the system. But if you look at the financial system, we can go on a different tangent with that. Let's go into that. Yeah, it's like, look, there's you've got the Federal Reserve, um, right now, America holds global reserve currency status, right? A lot of it's based on what happened with the petrodollar and the way there's a book called, um, I think it's called The Diary of an Economic Hitman. And it shows you how, I would say America, but how a country would gain control over other countries based on um, certain tactics they use. And the petrodollar was one of those tactics, right? So they've held global reserve currency status for a long time is now coming to an end. Jerome Powell, um, chairman of the Fed, has been open-minded and said, like, look, you know, we are open to another potential reserve currency because they know eventually the show's over. You can only run a debt cycle for so long. They kick the can down the road for a very long time and it will come to an end. Now, what comes after that, in my opinion, you look at, um, there's like a, a formation that's been put together now called BRICS. It's like Brazil, Russia, India, China and 
you know, that to me is going to be, that's a, that's a powerhouse in itself. But I think that we're going to move into more of a multi-reserve currency, whereas like a basket of currencies, not going to be one, I think there's going to be a basket of currencies. And, you know, in there, potentially down the line, maybe Bitcoin, you know, maybe not right now, it's probably too early, it's too volatile. But I think maybe at some point it will be. And you can look at now, and Bitcoin looks terrible now where it's at from, from the all-time high. Last year is still the best performing asset. And at the end of last year, end of November, it fell off a cliff. But it was still the best performing asset last year. You know, and if you look at what the best performing asset over the last 10 years, guess what it is? Still Bitcoin. Even now, when you're looking at it now, it's like sub 20K as we're recording this podcast. No. Still the best performing. Is that millions of percent? You know, yeah. so it's, it's yeah. you, you know, it's just people. I think look at crypto because they see people get rich quick, and it looks yeah. like people get rich quick. They think I'm only going to invest in crypto short term to make loads of money, right? And yeah, that can happen, but it's probably the wrong mindset to take into crypto. The right mindset is long term. Mm. The last block's going to be mined in 2140, right? So why would we take a short term mindset to invest in Bitcoin? That's the, and that's the thing. So. Yeah, there's many projects I thought probably could have done well, which I think a lot of stuff's happened, especially in the last six months that not many people probably thought was going to happen. The downfall of Luna, the recent downfall of FTX, all this stuff that's recently happened, I think that people didn't expect it to happen. You know, I think it was one of those things where, especially FTX, you know, you had Sam Bankman-Fried having meetings with the Fed, Gary Gensler, you had meetings, you had meetings with... Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, this person, he's on the front page of Forbes magazine. It's like, and then for that to all come to an end the way it has, and it's still now, it's like a domino effect. That hasn't even, we've just getting started with the, what's going to come after that, you know? So with everything that's going on there, you know, crypto, it shows how, how it's still in its infancy, still a lot to come. It does clearly need to be regulated. You know, a, a lot of the sort of the maxis don't like to hear that, but it's going to have to be regulated. Mm. Otherwise, it's not going to be a certified asset class long term. And you're still going to have all these this stuff happening now. It, you know, it's it's, nev it's not going to end otherwise. And as much as you can try and get rich quick, you don't. Uh, who's ever got rich consistently trying to time the market? It's just. You know, it's time in the market, as everyone knows. Um, so, so you think really we're going to be a cashless uh, oh, society? 100%. I, so for the CBDC, yeah, yeah, one million percent. They've like most Car a lot of Caribbean countries are already using CBDCs. Nigeria's got a CBDC. The Fed, I think it was like three, four days ago from today, where we, I was like seventh, seventeenth of November today. Yeah. So it was like last week or whatever, the Fed um, have just rolled out their pilot program to test their CBDC. The Bank of England in Jan twenty twenty said it was going to have a CBDC by the end of Jan uh, twenty twenty, which we mm -hmm. haven't. It's, it's, it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's going, and a lot of things come with that as well. What, right? do, you th what do you think the implications of that are? So look, the, you, you got to look at the pros and cons. Turns the counter argument. It's going to be more efficient. You know, you could argue that you know is tax automation um, more efficient. You could say yes. Um, so you don't have to go and file your taxes if you're getting taxed at source. Um, it's deflationary, so that gets rid of a lot of bookkeepers. Um, they sort of get rid of jobs. So does smart contracts get rid of a lot of the legal element, you know, of, of, of a lot of things. So I think CBDCs from that side, you could say is more efficient. I think on the flip side, it's going to be open us up to a universal basic income, um, mm. which I don't think is good for the public. You know, I think that um, the velocity of money is almost at zero and they want to try and stimulate the economy. They try to do it with QE didn't work um well you could say it stimulated the economy in certain ways but it didn't raise the velocity of money still like <laughs> close to zero um but you do need velocity in uh, uh you know a, a growing economy which we we don't have and i think that they think that they'll stimulate it because if if they can give you say 500 pound thousand pounds a month if you download the the central bank digital currency app on your phone um, and they say like they can put like a time limit on your money and they can tell you what you can spend it on. So they could say this 500 pounds, um, you know, you can go and spend that on groceries or fuel or whatever. Yeah. And, but it expires in four weeks if you don't spend it. So it forces you to spend it. So technically 
you're falsely stimulating the economy because you're forcing you to go and spend the money. Yeah. But what on the flip side there, which that sounds great, right? For people listening, like, well, free money? Cool. But the problem with it is then they're in total control of turning the tap on and off for yeah. you. And they can be like, well, okay, you spent too much on fuel this month, so you can't spend no more. But then again, you've you've also got, um, for people listening, they're going to be either one or two things, thinking that's fantastic or really scared. Mm. There is coins out there that known as safety coins, yeah, um, which I know you're quite fond of. Yes. Yeah, so um, obviously, I'm not going to say which ones that you are fond of. Yeah. Um, if you want to know, sign up to the 5-day <laughs> yeah. program um, or the 5 a.m. club. But yeah, that. I mean, if you wanted to touch on the safety coins. Yeah, so... Th- the privacy coins. So the privacy coins. Privacy coins. Yeah, yeah, they're um, they're private. So it's like they basically act like cash. So if you go to a bank, an ATM, mm. and you draw money out, let's say I draw twenty pounds out, mm. I can go and spend ten, mm. and then I can go and put ten back in, but they don't know that bank doesn't know why I've gone and spent the other ten on because I paid mm. in cash. Mm. It's the same thing. You take it off, say an exchange, you can go and do what you want with it, and then it comes back. Now on most people especially if you're very skeptical, be like, well, that's going to open up crime. Of course it will. But so does cash. Mm. So it's the same thing. So if you like a, a, a society with cash in it, then that will be the side of the new financial systems cash. But, you know, it depends how much they can police that as well. Like we don't know right now. Like at the end of the day, I think especially the last, 12 months has shown that every single project apart from bitcoin centralized and some people will well i mean is a centralized element so someone can do something in a centralized manner that can affect something which means that it's not fully decentralized right it can operate on the blockchain as decentralized but if i can go in i got the money and power to be the market maker then it's not really decentralized right now bitcoin the only reason bitcoin is decentralized is because you don't know who who made it if tomorrow somebody comes out and and they say I made it, and they can prove it, then okay. Now it's like, well, can you? What can you do? And I know it's all done in code and mm. very complicated mathematics. But as soon as someone is the owner and they can be targeted as the owner, then I think that takes away the decentralized aspect of it. Now, there's obviously you don't know who made Bitcoin, and I think I, I hope that the person or they never find out. Maybe they will. I hope they don't because I think that's where the value of Bitcoin comes from. Otherwise, since Bitcoin is a very old technology, mm. Bitcoin source code, very old. So much has come along a long way since then, blockchain. So yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting in the next like 10 years. I, I think there'll be a lot of people, um, since the massive, well, since it's, I say people saying it's falling off a cliff, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to get started mm. in, in it. Um, I think you've got to learn about it. Mm. Um, I don't think people should be scared about um, investing, but they've got to invest in the right way, not think I'm going to make a load of money very quickly. Like if you invest in property, um, I like to own the asset and hold for the long term. Mm. Um, You should look at, in my opinion, go into investing into crypto very much the same way as you would uh, buy and hold a a property rather than flipping it. You can do that, but trading anything has its increased risk um you can don't get me wrong you can always go and do that i'm not a, i'm not a financial advisor i wouldn't advise doing that but it comes with its own risks um and you could potentially lose lose a lot of money by doing that me personally i'll leave my money in and then when when ready to leave and, and exit i will um just one thing i wanted to advise uh, well ask about the importance of having it on a ledger hmm. and taking it off of the exchange how important is that well now it's, <laughs> yeah you know, it's always been important but now with everything that's happened i think people you know when an exchange can come and say we're we're halting withdrawals and you can't take your money out it's no difference to what a bank can do that's mm. what banks can do now they passed that i think it was the the g20 in like 2014 they put capital controls in pay, place it was one of the g g something summits uh, which allows banks to take your money and hold it whenever they want that's mm. what capital controls is to prevent a bank run because at the end of the day they inflate the money supply. So we can't all go and draw the money out together because it's not there, Mm. because they've made more of it, right? Same as in crypto. That's what's happened with these exchanges. So they want to try and prevent a bank run, so they stop withdrawals, but it's your money. So 
But the good thing with crypto is, yes, you can go to a bank and take all your money out and put it under your bed in cash or whatever, right? But we're moving to a cashless society. When it comes to cold storage, which would take it off an exchange, you can store your crypto in like a cold wallet off the exchange that you're, you own the keys to that wallet. So if you own the private keys, no one else can get your private keys. But I, I'd seen an article like a week and a half ago about some guy that's even saying, which ledger is my preferred cold storage, but some guy was saying that something went wrong with this ledger a few weeks ago. So, you know, who, again, who's who owns ledger? It's, it's, it's just a, it's the same as the financial system. This is, I think, that what's happened with crypto. It's just been totally exposed. So you need to be so careful mm. which platforms you use. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough. Um, it is tough, but you've got to go with what you truly believe in. Um, mm. Obviously, there's recommendations. If get in touch with D with with what ledger he uses. Um, now M and A, mm. mergers and acquisitions. That's your seems to be your baby at the minute. Mm. Um, you're heavily investing into that. Mm. Where are you currently at with that? Yeah, we've done quite a lot of deals. Um, like for me, as like as an investor you want the best ROI, right? Yeah. That, that's the thing we're all looking for. So for me, I like to diversify. I do, like I said, I believe in specializing before generalizing, but you know, if you already have an income stream, then you can start to generalize and look for other opportunities. So for me, almost every asset class has a ceiling, mm -hmm. but, but business doesn't. So, and if you like, so I just typed in years ago, the top, five richest people in the world, every single one of them was in business. Mm -hmm. That was it, you know, all business. And four out of the five was in acquisition. And you could argue all five were because Elon Musk bought Tesla, right? So yeah. he didn't start it. So you could say that the top five all buy businesses. So I was like, I'm missing something here. Trying to, you try, people are trying to guess are you rich or whatever they want to deem rich as or wealthy through all these different places. Most people try and turn to property, but it's like, well, there's literally no ceiling in business. There's, you buy a business, and let's say you've hit max the, the ceiling in that business because most don't have a ceiling because you can keep growing and growing, but depending on what business it is, you can, just go and, you can scale and buy another one buy and then one, scale yeah. through acquisition. And the beauty of buying businesses and going down the actual M&A route, you can do it two ways. You can either just buy a business, like a good business that pays you well, and then you've you're not set for life, but like you've got a good income for a long time, for as long as you want it, providing you look after the business. Or you can make your money on the exit. And you can make your money while you buy it because you still provide income. But if you buy and build a group, which a group's two or more, that's all. Yeah. You know, you don't need you only need ten. Then you can then buy either consolidating some of the things in the business or um maybe bringing them into one centralized hub or this is there's so many things you can do um and then you reduce costs by that way and you grow in other ways and there's loads of things you can do then you could buy for one multiple and you could buy two or three businesses at one multiple and then that average multiple comes one figure and then because it's now a group but there's a lot that goes into this it's not just a case of all oh, just no. buy three and sell them as a group you know you need to make sure that you know these are fully systemized that they operate correctly. They're very commercially appealing to someone like another investment firm, private yeah. equity, to actually want to buy them. It's not a yeah. case of just offloading but, these yeah. to anyone. It doesn't work like that. So um, yeah, and then you can potentially then exit that group at a, at a increased multiple and then you get paid well. So obviously, obviously moving on to your, your partners, you're doing deals with them as well. Yeah. Um, and people can get involved with that on the 5D program. Yeah. And then you're, you're obviously still invested in property as well, or have you sort of slowed that down to f concentrate on um, buying businesses? Yeah, so I don't buy property anymore. Like, not that I wouldn't, but... It's got to have a, a high enough return for you to, in order for you to do it, I suppose. Yeah, so for me, I think the last property I bought was, it was May 2020 on an online auction. That was literally the last thing I bought, right? Wow. And it felt really weird as well, like, you know, <laughs> on, buying a property online. You're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we bought there. It was just, it was on a street that we had other. So I, I already knew the comps, even though the market was a bit shaky. I was like, 
we got like our own comps on the street so yeah it's cool um and then from there i was like i need to just literally double down on what's going to bring me the most roi and that was going to be business and crypto at the time because obviously the halving um was just just literally just going through the halving so i was like right these are the two things i'm going to focus on because it made sense most roi and then yeah so from there um i sort of stopped buying property but look if you buy a good business or you have a good business that makes money, use the profits of that to buy property. Like to be fair, I've done all the BRR stuff, and like, not that I wouldn't keep doing it, but it's like people. I think people underestimate the amount of work that goes into property and 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 how the work that goes in to generate good income from property. Now, mm. if you're in like a good market where you can, you know there's a lot of buyers in the market and like a strong market where flips are good mm. cool yeah you can make a load like nice bits of cash right um don't do it now by the way no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um and then if you're someone that's buying the holding long term which that's what i was doing um then yeah you're going to generate some income if it's buy to lets of course hmos are going to give you more money and there's many different strategies you've got rent to rent all the other stuff mm. as well mm. um but if you want just like a normal solid portfolio where you've got buy to lets, I think people underestimate how many you need to live a good life, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. And and when you actually add up the amount of money, regardless of whether you recycle it and pull it all back out and do all that, the amount of actual capital that's needed to grow a portfolio and, you know, give you even five to 10 grand a month, right? The amount of buy to lets that you need to do that and the amount of money and work that goes into it that same money time and effort going into buying a business in my opinion because i've done both the the reward is literally a complete no-brainer it's interesting because it comes back to your abc column yeah yeah it, exactly it always comes back from what you've told me throughout this whole interview it always comes back to the abc it started yeah. off um i suppose the property is c yeah. It's a shitload of tasks because it always is in property. Yeah. And something will go wrong. If you're starting out in property, yeah. it will happen and it will go wrong. Yeah. It, it will start as a C column yeah. um, and you'll try and get it to A. And hopefully if you do a few, it will will maintain A, B and N, C. Yeah. But it will start at C. Yeah. Uh, and there's, if you can buy a business, you really should start at that. If cash flow, and which it should be, the main aim, because ultimately that's what you want to do is replace your income or live from the cash that is generated from multiple asset classes. Yeah, definitely. Like, look, the in income is more important than anything, right? That's what gets you through month to month. That's what gives you lifestyle and everything yeah. that comes with it. So it's all good having like a huge property portfolio that doesn't give you maybe a lot of income, but oh, one day it's going to be worth loads of money. Like to me, mm -hmm. it's like, well, for you to enjoy your life now you need income right you know and yeah that's the capital appreciation is just a bonus because mm. the property market who knows how you know are we going to potentially go for a decade of stagflation who knows right you know if you look pre the 70s on the property chart it was flat there mm. wasn't from the 70s when they they brought out the home ownership mortgage it's gone crazy because yeah. you, as soon as credit becomes available that's when everything goes wild yeah. if credit goes or credit tightens less things get bought because there's less money available. So right now, the cost of borrowing has gone up because rates have gone up. Who knows how long they're going to stay up? Who knows how long, how high they're going to raise? Inflation's just coming higher again, so they're probably going to raise again. And they're probably really going to raise again and again. And they probably will until they feel that they got a grip on inflation, right? Which could take a long time, right? Um, so if credit becomes expensive and the cost of borrowing is expensive, demand will go down because less things will be bought because it becomes unaffordable. The prop average house price to average income ratio is already 10 times. Mm -hmm. So when you add high interest rates in that equation, it becomes very hard then for someone to go and buy a property. So you've got to look at the, the both sides of it, right? So, you know, and of course, if you buy a business, the same thing is going to happen there. The cost of borrowing to get the finance of, to buy that business, that's also going to be more expensive. The difference of business, the ROI is a lot higher and a lot higher so you've got more room for error in a lot it's, it depends what business you buy right but we're looking for stuff which got like potentially like two-tiered management team good infrastructure we're looking for good businesses right mm. we're not looking for turnarounds you know especially in this market yep. some of the best turnaround specialists in the world are going to struggle in some in this market right yep. um 
So it depends what you're looking at. And people think that buying a business is so far away and it's not, it's literally, literally not. Now, do you have to have good business acumen? Of course it helps. Experience in the sector helps. Experience in business, of course, all of these help. And a lot of it's essential. But that's why if you did focus on something slightly bigger, and you was looking at stuff that had great infrastructure and a good management team, then you've got people to lean on. Yeah, There's businesses out there right now that the owner of the business, and these are small businesses, right? People need to remember, even a 10 million pound business is a small business. 20 million pound of businesses, you're closing on like middle, the, the M from the S, but still a small business. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you're like 50 million, then you're at like a middle market business. And then it starts to get bigger. So 10 million pound business isn't a big, it's a small business, class is a small business. But in those 10 million pound businesses, of course, margins make, it, it all depends on margin. Some businesses have got terrible margins, but let's say it's a 10 million pound business. It has management team. There's so many of those out there that the owner doesn't do hardly anything in the business. They got great management team that drive the business. So whether that owner's there or you're there, of course, there is a leadership aspect of it. And, but you know, there's, there's ways to incentivize the management team yeah. as well. Yeah. Maybe potentially give them some rollover equity, yeah. get them more, you know, unfortunately a business and life is ruled on manipulation. People don't like to think that because they don't want to believe it. It's the truth. But it is. And people like <laughs> to get people in golden handcuffs to keep them in there and incentivize them to continue to grow the business. Every single day, every one of us will either use or have manipulation put to us, whether it's in your relationship, whether it's regardless of what it is. It could be when you negotiating. Well, yeah, manipulation slash negotiation. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, every, even if you, you with your partner, you want to choose what you're going to eat or whether you want to, if your kids want to watch a movie or something, yeah. it, we, we're like, oh, but what about this one? And you just, it's, it's every single day. You've, so, wa you've watched this film four times now. I want to change it over. Yes. Yeah, so, oh, <laughs> are you sure this film's good? It's because it's got this, this, and this, and you like try to sell them it. Right? And there's, it, yeah, it's, it's, but this happens in business. So there's ways of putting certain things in place mm. where one, you can mitigate the risk a lot because with buying a business is a lot of creativity. You know, very creative. Yeah. Um, almost to the point where you end up trying to force the deal because you can get so creative, so you've got to be careful yeah. with that. Um, but yeah, um, there's a lot of things you can do to incentivize current management team um, post-acquisition. I mean, I'm conscious of your time. I mean, I could talk to you for hours about mm. just m and I mean, I've got a few more questions mm. um, for you, um, but I'm very conscious of your time. Do you think that your um, diary is a reflection of your own happiness? So... Have you, have you, have you heard me talk about this? So, yeah. So, so a friend of mine, a guy called Nadav Wilf, right? Very interesting guy. He, um, he's friends, he knows Elon Musk, Richard Branson, and we had him on the 5D mm. and he had two exits done very well for himself. He's quite like hippie-ish. <laughs> and I jumped on just before, probably you've heard this and, um, so, and he, he said to me, he's like, how are you doing? I was like, yeah, I'm good. You know, how are you? He's like, good. And he's like, what are you doing at the moment for your happiness? And mm. I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm happy. No, but what are you doing? What makes you happy? And I'm like, where's he going with this? I just want to quick catch up before, <laughs> you know, he's such a deep guy. And, and then he was asking me what made me happy. So I started to say, and he's like, remember, your diary is a reflection of your self-love. And I was like, oh, wow. That was deep before the it was so deep before the session, but I didn't really get a chance to process it there and then. After the session, I thought about it and I was like, "Yeah, that's so powerful." Because, like we just talked about, work does make me happy, but there's other things that also make you happy. Mm. And the one thing that I think that we do is we tend to prioritize stuff that maybe we shouldn't. As in, the easy example I always use is on the way if you're want to eat at this certain time and you know you need to eat at this certain time and a meeting comes up you'll skip the meal for the meeting every day of the week most people yeah. will but we'll never do it the other way around and the one could be for our health and we'll put our we'll jeopardize our health over say money when which one actually is more important because we you know yeah. depends what you decide is more important right yeah. so yeah i think that it is important to make sure that don't try and fit because this is what he said don't try and fit your happiness in around your diary Put your diary around your put your diary around your happiness, and I was like, I was like, yeah, that's powerful. 
Very smart man. Yeah, he is. <laughs> very, very, very smart man. Um, I yeah. To tell you the truth, I did hear you speak about that, but mm. it's so powerful mm. that stuck in my head. Yeah, it, was, it, it is. It's, it's a powerful saying. Um, I had to ask you the question, and you said it word for word. Yeah, it's, it's, obviously that powerful that you remembered oh, the answer yeah, as well. It's so powerful. <laughs> it's good, but I think that I wanted to um, allow the viewers to. Mm -hmm. Hear the question and see your reaction to it because it's that good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's well, I mean, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Mm. You know, I, I don't even know. It's hard. It's, it's, it's such a hard question. I've learned from so many good people. I'm, I'm more of like a practical learner, so I see people do stuff, and there's not one thing that I've seen I'm like, that's the best thing. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I think that a lot, I don't know, I think you can learn, like direct advice is one thing and then like indirect advice is another. There's in like indirect advice where like, I see someone else make mistakes. So there's things that, you know, people that I've probably looked up to have done, they've been so good in one part of their life and they have they keep doing something in another part of their life where I'm like, that's, if you didn't do that, mm -hmm. you could be so much more, you could do so much more. And I learn a lot from that because I'm like, I take the good and the bad from people. Mm. What I think is the good and the bad. Obviously, people are going to look at different things. And I look at it and I'm like, wow. Like, if you do what you do and you do this as well, that the compromise of it, imagine you didn't do that. So I, that's that's like, for me, that indirect advice that someone doesn't know they're giving me, I learn more from that. But I've had loads of good advice. You know, I just it's hard for me to pick like the yeah. best. What, what's the what's the worst? What's the worst piece of advice you've ever seen? Um... Probably not in these words, but I've had a lot of people be like, like why do you want to do this, this, and this? Like, do you, you like, I, I, I suppose is, is, is people when people like play down your ideas or yeah. they, they don't, they look at you and you can tell they don't believe that's going to happen. And mm. so it's not so much like the worst advice is, is someone's, is people's reaction to, to ideas. So, I believe you've got to be careful anyway you share your ideas with. Um, and if people do really want to know and you trust the person and you're like, this is what I want to achieve, and their reactions when like, oh, I don't know about that. I learn a lot from that too. So I don't think there's no like direct like quotes on best advice, worst advice. I think it's, I'm a very like, I analyze a lot and watch and I learn so much from that. I think it's very important for people to be aware of that, that, I shared everything, all my goals, my ambitions with, again, I'll revert back to my family. Although they completely disagreed with what I wanted to do, mm. um, their reaction, what, it's one, not what they said, it's what they didn't say that affected me more. Mm. That yeah, impacts yeah. a lot of people. I, I agree. Um, and it might, be not, might not be your family, it might be your friends. Mm. Um, it could be anyone. It's what people don't say that you need to be more aware of rather than the gratification that you do get. 100%. To me, that cut deep more than saying, yes, go and get it. You're going to 100% get it. I don't need that. It's I notice what people don't say more than what they do. I think that's so powerful because I, I, I totally agree. And because you, that's when you overthink and that's when you think. Because yeah. it's hard not to think about that when, especially with people that you kind of expect it from. But like, or or you or either you expect or you want to hear it from, mm. and when they don't say it, that does cut deep. So you're like, you know, you you know what you're doing. You know how dedicated you are, and yeah. and all of us like our ego pampered in certain ways. And I think that a bit of a appreciation for your hustle, or a bit of mm. appreciation for your dedication, or your discipline, or consistency. You know, even though you're a disciplined and consistent individual, you still want someone to be like, yeah, look, like keep hustling, you know, yeah. or, or look, a fair play, I, I, I admire your dedication because you've come up against all odds and yeah. you're still going. Like everyone still needs a little bit of that, you know, it's, it's nice. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter about your background. Everyone faces challenges. But from my from my own opinion, is you've got to be aware of what people are not saying about you. Mm. Um, not ignoring the fact, but just be aware of it. Because mm. that's powerful. 
to, oh, me, yeah. to me. To yeah, me. Yeah, me too. I, I, I agree. You, you do need to be aware of it. Um, your biggest regret? Oh, there's probably a few. Um, probably the one that like cuts me the deepest now is probably with my dad. So my dad tried to like get me involved in what he was doing, right? And I was way too immature at the time. I was like oh. 16. And he was like, yeah, you like learn, learn the CMAP to be a mortgage advisor, do this, learn this. And I was so focused on all those other stuff. I was like, I was, my head went in it. And I regret it because a lot, like I regret and don't regret. So I don't regret all the mistakes, not all the mistakes that I made because I learned a lot from them. But a lot of where I, I wanted to get to, that bit in the middle, if I just listened and I just was like, well, because now, now he's not here. I, I, I re, re, like, I would love for us to work together now, you know, like, and I had the, I, I did work with him when I was a kid and I didn't make the most of it and I didn't, probably didn't appreciate it and didn't, didn't put the effort in. And now it's like, ah, oh, do you know what? Like, I, I would love nothing more. There's no one else in the world I want to work with more than him. And now I've, I've, so I regret that because it's like, I didn't take it serious and I should have because I should have listened to him because he's my dad and he only wanted the best for me. But I think that sometimes we turn our, our, the people that we should listen to into like enemies, not as in like an enemy, but I mean, we don't take them serious because they're like, nah, they don't, they don't understand when they, a lot of the time they don't, but a lot of the time they do mm. and they want the best for you. So yeah, that's probably my biggest regret. Yeah. Just touched on your dad not being here, he's passed. Yeah, he passed last year, yeah. I would imagine that your, your mental health was, was impacted by that. Yeah, so it was a big thing for me because like, he lived in Hong Kong, so I used to go out and see him, uh, mm. what, a couple of times a year until COVID happened. And then uh, that was the hardest thing for me was I couldn't get it because of COVID. That that frustrated me, that, mm. you know? So that was um, that was a hard, hard one. But yeah, I don't know what it was in me. I went into like, like warrior mode. Mm. Like, you know, because obviously me and my brother are close. And I think that he got affected. Like we both got affected, but I think that I was like, right, I'm just going to be a hundred mile an hour on work. Because I remember he died on the Saturday and I had two mastermind sessions, Sunday and Monday. And I contacted <clears throat> the one guy that I was on the mastermind with. I'm like, look. Um, no, no, so my mastermind, the 5D, I was like, look, guys, I, I'm not doing it this week. But then the Monday, the, it was someone else's. So I wasn't going to do it. But I just did. I was like, do you know what? I'm going to do it. What's the, what? Like, I literally, you have the day, I was like, I had a day where I felt down, like the Saturday. And then I remember in the afternoon on the day, I was like, well, I'm just sat here. Like, Obviously, I'm upset. I'm going to be upset. But I can't just sit in here. And this is like the first day. So I, I just, just booked a haircut purposely, right? So I'm like, I just got to get out. And it was hard. And I'd like, it was bad because at the time, my brother, because I went, I went to the States to try and get to Hong Kong from there. And you could only go via New Zealand. And they shut the New Zealand border, so I couldn't get there. My brother was in Dubai. He went from there to Hong Kong. He had to do 21-day hotel quarantine. So he was in hotel quarantine and I go back to Dubai. So that day when I went out, I went to the place he worked, right? And they was like, oh, sorry to hear about your dad. He's, um, and he had just died that day. They're like, I know your brother's going to go and see him. He's out there now. So it was like quite hard to hear that. Because mm. I was like, they didn't know it happened, right? So I was like, oh my God, I put myself in a position here. And you start to get, I started a bit anxious because I was like, I don't really want to, talk about this so yeah i did i suppose it did affect me but i think the best thing that i did was just that next day i just powered through it i was like i'm just gonna i'm just gonna keep doing what i'm doing because it was like i had like another flame lit inside me which i had i, I had this like flame like in covid i had this thing where i was like i don't even care what's going on in the world i'm not letting this stop me like i'm not just gonna sit here I'm going, and that's why when Dubai was still open, I'm, I'm going there. I'm not staying in the UK. I'm going where the world's open, and I'm going to continue to on this what I'm doing. And then I think it was like 
where that flame like went out for that day, like the next day, it was like, I don't even know what it was. I just remember waking up and I had this like fire in me and I, I, don't, I can't even explain it. It was just, it was crazy. And from then I just haven't stopped. And like, you know, sometimes like my wife might say to me like, oh, you know, oh, how are you, how are you and stuff. And like, I'm never, it's never going to be easy because I'm never going to probably mentally accept it because you just, you don't want to. As in like, you've got no choice to, but you don't really want to fully accept that that's happened because I was close to him, you know what I mean? So mm. it's hard, but yeah, I just, the hard, the easiest thing, not the easiest, sorry, the best thing I did was just work through it, power through it and keep going. Because I don't know why, if I just sat there, that's not my personality. So no. God knows what that would have done to me. I think you're right. That you, you can't, you can't just sit there. Um, but for for a lot of people that, that, that are listening, that they've been through a similar thing uh, mm -hmm. during COVID. Um, but the the coping mechanisms that you've just you've just touched on, which is working through it, the dangers that I foresee is burnout, mm -hmm. which I've certainly experienced. I don't know if you have experienced it yet, um, but do you feel that that could potentially happen at some point? I would imagine your wife, as you've already just touched yeah. on. She said, "Are you okay?" And, and with with your characteristics, as you've you've touched on throughout this whole interview, you're not the type of person to slow down. You you will just continue going. Mm. Um, is that potent? Is that a potential um, situation that may arise? Should you not uh, not not deal with it? Deal with it's the wrong word. M not manage your emotion. Manage your emotions is the wrong word. Learn to. Um, accept because accept yeah. acceptance is a big thing yeah it might happen later in life like, absolutely I don't know. you know like obviously i have days sometimes i just you know mm. you, you think about it or whatever but like maybe i'll fully accept it later in life and like maybe i'm putting it off i don't know but like for me is like I've, I've experienced burnout in work like you know i've i've had a business before that I, like to the point where i remember working so many hours. Mm -hmm. I remember the one day I came home, my mum had the kids. I went over hers to pick them up. And I remember I just, I just fell asleep. Like I, I can't even remember when I went to sleep. I was on the floor in the living room mm -hmm. and I just woke up and I was just like, I, I must've been that burned out yeah. that I just passed out basically. And like, so I've experienced that before, but I think then I didn't really know. I was a lot younger. I don't think I knew really know how to like manage my time. Yeah. And, and and delegate. I think I was just trying to do everything like we talked about earlier. So it could still happen now, you know, but I feel that I'm I'm definitely more in control and more in touch with the way I operate. So I know I can, if I feel it a bit, She my, my wife's very good at reading that. Like literally she knows when I'm getting a little bit mm. stressed out and I, she'll literally say to me, it's what she used to say when my dad was here, go see your dad book a flight go see your dad she used to say and I was like what's wrong she's like I, I, you need to get out of here I can tell and now she'll say like I'll oh, go to Dubai or go go see Craig or in the States she she's literally she'll tell me and she's and I'm like why she's like, I can tell you need to go and I'm like cool so she's very supportive like that and it's good to have that because so, so they are your coping mechanisms yeah 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 100 yeah, yeah. that, that's yeah. that's what I was angling at was yeah yeah for the people that can't do that yeah. Um, there is a load of other um, mechanisms that you can put in place, which obviously I've spoken about prior mm. to that. People know my um, battles and my demons, which obviously I won't go into now because mm. it'll bore everyone again. Mm. Um, but yeah, they're, the, the ones that I've got in place are very similar to yours. I just don't go to Dubai. Um, um, yeah, yeah. It might not be the gym. Simple, yeah, but effective. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? So it's everyone has their own. Yours is I need to go and work in a different location. Yeah, but it's, environment. Yeah. You've got to get yourself out. But I think what you said about the gym then, I said, so I think one of the easiest wins is get those endorphins going because yeah. like for me, whereas like, so say like gym, like as in weights in the gym, like, I think a lot. So for me, that wouldn't work for me. You know what I'm saying? But like, if I go and play football, I don't think of anything or basketball or boxing. I don't know why, but I don't think of anything else, no matter what's going on, other than the sport, because that's like, I don't know, that's what allows my mind to come off it. Mm -hmm. So I can just go, anyone can go and play down the local football team, go and train, 
and run around. Maybe you don't like football. Maybe you like something else. Maybe it is the gym. Maybe it's running. But whatever it is, if you can get your endorphins going, you'll naturally feel better anyway about yourself and you will take your mind off it. So I think that first and foremost, that's the best thing you can do is what you just said. Yeah. Is find something that, an activity I think helps a lot. A hundred percent. And everyone that knows, that listens to the podcast, knows me um, personally, will know that that's the go-to medicine. It's not medication. Um, million percent go to the gym or get outside you've got to raise that heart rate because it will just well not forgetting about it but you'll just relax you relax after and go do you know what i'm in a better headspace hmm. a million percent yeah. um uh, but what's the future goals for yourself now um you know they, they change all the time but probably now um I, I, I want to build five D Capital Partners to a hundred million. Just probably is a just a number that's plucked out of thin air, but it's more because I think it can be done, and I think that it's achievable for anyone to do. So I'm like, I think that could happen. So I just want to do that just to do it. I'm not saying that anyone needs that money because they don't. I don't think in life, but that's my one goal. Um, and just to be fair, I want my family involved in in everything. I want to be able to build something that my kids have opportunity to, like, be able to put yourself in a position where they listen. As in, not that they're guaranteed to listen, but I feel that if I didn't do certain things and I don't maintain certain things by the time they're old enough to understand, to make their own choices in money and career, I feel that if I'm not like what society deems as successful, would they still take me serious if I try and give them advice? Yeah. So I want to make sure that more for them. Like I've, I've, you know, I don't know if you, I've enjoyed life up to now. Really, like there's a lot of stuff that I haven't, but you know, I've enjoyed it, and I just feel that I want to keep maintaining it more for them. I want to be able to, you know, because a lot of things I believe that there's a lot of things that you can get learn from life that you need to let them learn, but. There's obviously a lot of things in this world that you can also keep them from because some stuff you just don't, why, why do you need to know? 100%. Yeah, I, Again, I agree with that because I've got three of my own. So yeah. I, I completely agree <laughs> with what you're saying. Dee, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. Um, it, you've, you've amazed me from where you've, where you've come from to where you currently are now. Um, you've helped so many people. Um, you, it's obvious that your wife is proud of you. Your dad will be proud of you from what you said. Your, your, fa your whole family, the network you've got around you, um, the whole support that you've got around you. You've helped, like I say, I'll say it again, you've helped so many people, myself included. Um, again, I want to congratulate you on all of your success. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast again. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.